Welcome to the New Books Network. I'm Caleb Zachran, Assistant Editor of the New Books Network, and you're listening to New Books in Science. Today I'm speaking with Chris Impey, University Distinguished Professor of Astronomy at the University of Arizona. We're discussing his new book, Worlds Without End, Exoplanets, Habitability, and the Future of Humanity. A great interpreter of hard science, Chris guides us through the world of astrobiology. Chris, thank you for joining me today on the New Books Network. Yeah, it's good to be with you, Caleb. Of course, uh, you know this, this is a really interesting book. I, definitely, the type of thing uh, that you know I would I would love to also see in like a documentary format. It, it felt very much like I was reading like a uh, you know Carl Sagan esque uh, uh, book or or documentary. But before jumping into that, I was wondering if you could just tell us a little bit about yourself and your background. Sure, uh, I won't tell from my accent, but I'm a Scot. I was born in Edinburgh, raised in. England and London and New York and eventually moved to the States because there are not many stars visible in Britain. So uh, I've been here 40 years, Arizona for 35, beautiful skies, 300 clear nights a year. Can't beat that. Um, So I'm a professor, do the usual mixture of research and teaching and a lot of outreach. I've written, I think, 10 books now and give lots of lectures and talks and have massive open online courses that I think are up to about 400,000 enrolled, not all at the same time. But I do know all their names. And, you know, as far as this book is concerned, uh, was there a main inspiration for it? Well, the field is just moving so fast. It was like gangbusters. It's actually a hard uh, subject to write a book about. It's easy to write an article. Um, But the number of exoplanets grows daily almost and certainly weekly. So it's very hard to put a mark in the sand and say, "Okay, now write a book. Uh, but it's it was so hot and things are moving so fast and we're approaching, I think, the detection of life beyond Earth. I think it's going to happen. Um, and so it seemed nice to do a put my finger on a pulse and just say where exoplanet hunting is and astrobiology in a larger sense. So, yeah, but before getting into, you know, where we are now or where we're soon headed, you know, this book, it starts at the top with talking about the very early, uh, I guess you could call them astronomers, who were, were looking to the stars and were, were wondering if there were other things uh, out there uh, like like our, our Earth. And I was wondering if you could talk about who the first people were to think about planets in the way that we do today. Yes. I mean, it's a little tricky when you go historical to not just project modern views onto people who are philosophers and thinking in general terms. The sort of the, the negative uh, influence on this field was Aristotle because his smothering intellect essentially said the earth was unique, there are no other worlds, end of story, full, full stop. And really, he's, he's smothered a lot of interesting ideas that had happened in, in Greek times. Um, then, of course, you flash forward to people like Giordano Bruno, who is burned at the stake as a heretic. Uh, and he said the sun, the stars are other suns, no reason not to have planets around them, no reason not to have life forms on them, and no reason to have creatures that are like us on them. All speculation, but very bold speculation. So all these people are are speculating, and Kepler wrote science fiction about going to the moon and so on. And uh, And so, you know, it's the absence of data, you can sort of imagine anything. And I think the Copernican revolution was what primed people for the fact that we're not special in our location in the universe. And one part of not being special would be if biology is not unique to this planet. So so when did we first start identifying? Uh, obviously, you know, there was awareness of, of celestial bodies, but when did we first start actually identifying planets uh, as their own, as, as like ours? So exoplanet research you know, really didn't get anywhere until there were big telescopes and especially very good spectrographs in the 1970s and 80s. And it was a sort of field of broken dreams. There were a number of astronomers in the 70s and 80s who, who you know, made claims that just didn't stand up. And, and so people kind of got skittish for a while about claiming an exoplanet. And the fundamental problem is easy to state. Uh, the Earth, for example, reflects about a billionth of the sun's light. And so if you're looking at the Earth orbiting a sun from afar, you're looking at something that's billion times fainter than the star and very close to it on the sky, like a firefly in a, next to a stadium floodlight. So that's a brutal experiment to do. And it was only these indirect methods that actually succeeded in the 1990s. And what was that first discovery like, uh, you know, that was truly confirmed that there was an exoplanet orbiting another star? 
Well, the true history, of course, is a little um, is tough for a couple of radio astronomers working in Puerto Rico because the first planets to be found were in 1992, and they were orbiting a pulsar, and and people you know, to their, a little bit to their shame, astronomers essentially dismissed this because well, how could there be planets around a dead star that died as a supernova? What does that even mean? But they were planets, they're pulsar planets, and they've stood the test of time. And those researchers were kind of hard done by because the Nobel Prize went to a Swiss team three years later for 51 peg. And they were using a small telescope, a one meter telescope on a pretty poor site in Switzerland. And, you know, the food and the wine is good there. So I guess it's worth having a bad site when you have those compensating factors. Um, and so they it was a surprise to them and to everyone, because what they found, of course, was a, a, a half Jupiter mass planet that was tearing around its star every four days, which, if you think about it, is pretty insane because we Mercury is the closest planet and it takes three months to go around the sun. So this is a very unprecedented discovery. And then you also in the book discuss the uh, the early development and deployment of the Ke of the Kepler Space Telescope. So I, I was wondering if you could talk about what that's what a space telescope even is, uh, but specifically what makes the what made the Kepler Space Tel Telescope so unique. So Kepler was a wonderful mission. Um, it, the PI uh, Bill Baruki, who worked at NASA his whole life, uh, he called it the most boring mission ever because it was designed to stare at a patch of sky for five years and take a picture every six seconds of the same patch of sky. That's all very boring, but it was beautifully designed to look at about 150,000 stars in this patch of sky and to just look for very uh, subtle dips in brightness of these stars when a planet would cross the face of any of them. And it was sensitive enough being in space to detect a, a dip that was less than a percent, less than a 10th of a percent. Uh, because when an Earth crosses a sun-like star, it, it dips it, the brightness dips by a hundredth of a percent. And that was the spec on this mission. So, and it didn't, it nearly didn't succeed. He had to pitch it four times to NASA and it was shot down every time as being either too difficult or why do you do this? Because we there are no exoplanets and you're wasting your time. And he persisted and his team persisted. I think Carl Sagan put them over the top because they had an advisory team which had some prominent people like Sagan who just told NASA, you need to do this mission. This is important. Uh, you know, I, I'd be interested to also know, you know, for you, uh, what, what it was like when, when this news first came out, like what was your experience of it? So we, it was front page headlines, of course, in the, in the wider world in astronomy, it went like wildfire. Um, and there were some hard luck stories beyond the radio astronomers that, that found pulsar planets. Um, there was a California team that had the same data, essentially 51 peg and its planet sitting on their hard drive. And they just not reduced that data because nobody thought a Jupiter could go so fast around a star. A Jupiter, our Jupiter takes 12 years. So they thought they had to gather data for years to find a Jupiter mass planet, which is all that you could detect back then. And so they had the data sitting there. And within days of the discovery, they ground it out with the not very good computers of the time and confirmed the discovery and found a couple of more exoplanets, the second and the third. So it was very exciting. And again, these were very confusing planets because our solar system has the nice small rocky things close to the sun and the big gassy things further away and these many of the first discoveries were not like that at all there were these hot jupiters so I, i'd be really interested to hear uh, you sort of walk through what these projects look like so you know from beginning to end you know you, you decide i want to look in this particular in this direction look at this uh you know series of, of stars and try and figure out where the exoplanets are what would that actually uh, the the whole ex, you know experiment and test and then ultimately the proof what would that look like like how would that whole process work right well i mean it's interesting to use the discovery though nobel prize winning discovery of 51 peg as an example because that team sort of sidled into this field from a different direction these these uh, michelle mayor and didier quillos um were studying binary stars they weren't actually looking for planets they studied uh stars that are on very tight orbits of each other and sometimes there's a big mass and brightness difference between the two stars. So they were observing with a very rapid cadence, you know, lo looking for systems where the orbital times were days or a week or so. And that's why they were taking data fast enough to have detected 51 peg. And so to their surprise, they found a binary 
system in their catalog, which wasn't really a star, two stars. It was a star and a planet around the star. And, and it took the observation, it, it was quick. It only took a few weeks to confirm the observation because the orbit repeats every four days. So, you know, two weeks of data, you've got three orbits, add it together and you've nailed the observation. And the later discoveries sort of work the same way using the Doppler method. So you're looking for the planet tugging on the star. You don't see the planet. You just see a Doppler shift uh, that's periodic with the period of the planet's orbit. And so you're looking with very good spectroscopy. And this is a field that was driven by technology as much as anything uh, for this repeating signature of a blue shift, then a red shift, then a blue shift, then a red shift. And that gives you the period. It also gives you the mass of the star of, and the planet. How does the technology from the 90s compare to the technology that we have today? Well, the technology that led to the discovery was to do with spectroscopy. So this is a little into the weeds of astronomy. People think of astronomy as taking deep pictures and beautiful pictures. But a lot of astronomy is about spectroscopy. That's how we learned what the universe was made of in the 1920s and 30s. That's how we know the distance to things through the redshift and galaxies and the distant universe. And it's how we found exoplanets. Now, this, the subtlety of the signature is that a small mass planet is moving like at walking speed. And that's a very slow speed divided by the speed of light. It's a tiny fraction of a percent. And that's the precision which you need to measure a spectral feature in a spectrograph. And, and that was not possible through the 60s and 70s. And these teams, the teams that first found exoplanets and the ones that have found them since, we're pushing the envelope of spectroscopy, of the technology of spectroscopy, uh, to an enormous degree. They, they improved the spectrographs by orders of magnitude from the 70s through the 90s. And uh, you couldn't do the experiment otherwise. So as it stands today, um, you know, obviously we know that there are hundreds of billions of, uh, of stars out there. They're, they're, they're easy to see. Uh, but how, how many exoplanets um, are we aw currently aware of? And you know, is there also, are there some educated guess, guesses about how many exoplanets there might be, uh, you know, in the Milky Way, for example? Yeah, there's some decent estimates. So we have the number changes routinely, but it's just over 5,300 confirmed exoplanets in NASA's database. You can just go to their website and the number does change all the time. Uh, there's another six or 7,000 that are unconfirmed, but very likely to be real. Uh, so that's only thousands. But it's a good enough census, all fairly near. So first, first perspective, these uh, exoplanets are around stars that are hundreds to a few thousand light years away. Well, the Milky Way is 100,000 light years across. So that's really our backyard. But it's a big enough sample that you can extrapolate to the galaxy. And so that's what people have done now. Uh, and the number is, well, the simple number is easy to state. There's basically at least one planet per star in the Milky Way. And then the, if you go down to the red dwarfs, the feeble stars, the Milky Way has 400 billion stars. And so that's about how many planets there are, 400 billion, maybe a trillion if there are a couple of planets per star. It's an incredible number. The more interesting number, of course, is how many habitable planets are there? How many Earth-ish? You guess my next question. <laughs> yeah. So how many are like Earth in, in, in major aspect, either in size or in mass and in distance from their star where you could have water on the surface? Now, that's a much smaller number, but it's still an interesting number. It's about 10 billion in the Milky Way, an incredible number, actually, because any of those could have biology on them. So, yeah, that's, uh, you know, one star for or, or, or soon to be one star for each person living uh, maybe 80 years down down the road. But, uh, you know, this is, a uh, you know, take, feel free to take this in whichever direction. But do you have any any favorite planets, obviously, besides Earth, but planets that, you know, you think about and you and you. Uh, maybe fantasize about, you know, being able to visit someday in the future, obviously, you know, barring a, barring sure. our ability to come up with, you know, wormholes or some, well, some sort of science sci-fi. What you just said, of course, reminds me with the almost the same number of pl habitable planets as people on Earth. There's a, you know, you could have, everyone could have their own planet. You know, we could assign a planet to every person. Now, you know, that's a marketing opportunity, I guess. Nobody owns space. So nobody yeah, you can, can yeah. yeah. Nobody should be selling these things uh, and you'd never get there anywhere. They're trillion, thousands of trillions of miles away. Uh, so favorites is tricky. There, there's so many cool planets now. I mean, some of them are extreme and exotic. You know, they have molten lava raining out of their skies because they're super hot and close to their stars. Uh, some of them have diamond like material. 
drifting down through their atmospheres from crystalline carbon. So, the, you know, there's sort of an exotic Guinness Book of Records planets. But I think a lot of astrobiologists like the TRAPPIST system. So that one got a lot of airplay a few years ago because that's a system with seven confirmed exoplanets and possibly a couple of others. And four are Earth-like and in, ha- in the habitable zone. So you've got four shots of life in this one stellar system, which is pretty amazing. It's a, it's a red dwarf star, so it's not a sun-like star. So these planets are pretty close to the star to be habitable. Um, it's about 40 light years away, so it's not as close as it could be, but it's not super far either. It's, it's a compelling system. <laughs> well, yeah, that, that's, uh, you, you know, when you say uh, habitable, I'm wondering if you could break down what that means. You know, are there, are there particular uh, checklists uh, that, that we would need to consider something habitable versus not habitable? Yeah, I mean, it's important to remember that astrobiologists have been a little generic in how they define habitability. Uh, So the simplest definition, which is still used quite often, is just that the planet be uh, at the right distance from its star, whatever that is, a sun-like star or a dimmer star, for water to potentially, if it exists, to be liquid on the surface. That's it. Now, that begs a whole bunch of questions, uh, most important of which is how do we know what the boundaries for life are? Uh, Because there's life on Earth that sits in the deep ocean with hydrothermal power and doesn't need a star. So right away, the Earth tells you that's a too narrow definition of habitability. You've got moons in the outer solar system like Europa and and Enceladus, which have all the ingredients for life, and there could be biology there. And they're in the frigid part of a solar system. So that's not the habitable zone either. So there's plenty of reasons to believe that that simple definition is too narrow. And And the other reason it's too narrow is it's basically just calculating the intensity of sunlight or starlight at the surface of a planet but the planet will have an atmosphere and the atmosphere changes that temperature so you know our atmosphere has greenhouse gases and other gases that trap heat so if you don't know what the atmosphere of a planet is made of and we mostly don't then you're not even accurately being able to talk about habitability that way so you, you seem pretty optimistic about our ability to eventually encounter some, uh, you know, uh, extraterrestrial life, some some sort of life. Uh, what type of life, if we do encounter something, uh, do you think we're likely to encounter? Would it be something as de- as advanced or developed as humans, or would it be, uh, you know, very simple life form? Well, logically, we evolved from microbes, so you've got to get microbes before you can get people, and so. It's, there's going to be more microbial life in the universe than advanced life. That just stands to reason logically. And if you look at the history of the Earth, then it maybe is telling you that there's a lot more microbial life than advanced life, because you could go back, could have gone back to the Earth for 90% of the 4 billion years there's been life here, and you would have needed a microscope to find it. Life only went on to the land, and you only got plants and animals in the last few hundred million years. So that may argue that it takes a long time or it's difficult or it doesn't happen very often. It's a sample of one, so you can't really extrapolate. Um, so e- by either reckoning, microbes are should be out there. And the other argument for that is that life formed on the Earth very early when the Earth was, to most of our viewpoints, very inhospitable. Meteors were raining down, the, the crust had barely solidified, the oceans had barely condensed out of steam, and life apparently started around then. So biology is pretty sturdy, pretty robust, and if you have the ingredients, it certainly, we we think, biologists think that eventually the ingredients will come together and give you something we call biology. But that begs another whole question, because biologists don't agree on how to define life. So (laughs) there's a lot of big question marks attached to this subject. Uh, two two uh, concepts that you discuss that that are very interesting in the the question for the search for extraterrestrial life are the Fermi paradox and Drake's equation or the Drake equation. I was wondering if you could tell our listeners a little bit about those two uh, notions and uh, what you think of them. Right. So we talked about microbes and the fact that logically there should be more microbes than advanced life forms in the universe. But with those numbers, with 10 billion biologic, potential biological experiments just in one galaxy, and then if you want to be proper, you multiply by 100 billion galaxies because they all have the same ingredients. Uh, let's just stick with our galaxy. That's 10 billion potential biological experiments. And the real estate of time is as important as the space real estate because 
you could have had an Earth clone that formed 8 billion years before our Earth formed. So you have biology that could have an incredible head start on us out there as well. And who knows how advanced that could get and how that would look. So for those reasons, the ones of statistics and time, astronomers think that it would be remarkable if there were not some advanced creatures with intelligence or technology out there. But it's exceptionally difficult to pin that down. And the Drake equation was a formalism developed in 1960 by Frank Drake. Um, So he was at the time a young researcher at the National Radio Astronomy Lab in West Virginia. And uh, at that time, they had a meeting of the world's astrobiologists. That was nine people in a room. That was all there was back in 1960. And he was a young postdoc. And just to frame the discussion, he went to the board and, and wrote an equation which had all the factors he thought you would have to know or measure to work out how many intelligent, communicable civilizations there were in the Milky Way at any given time. He did that, and it's still used. I mean, it's just a foundational uh, a tool of astronomy or astrobiology. But even he admitted that it was more of a container for ignorance than an equation, the way we might think of a math equation, because the first three factors of the Drake equation are actually measured now. We know how many stars are born a year. We know how many planets there are per star. And we pretty much know how many Earth-like planets there are per star. Those are the first three factors. The next four, we don't know at all. That's how many of those potentially biological worlds actually get biology, how many of those does biology develop intelligence at some point? And how many of those does intelligence develop technology at some point? And how long does that persist? Those four things are completely unknown. And so when you multiply seven things where three are measured and four are I don't know, the answer is I don't know. And the Fermi uh, question or paradox, which you also mentioned, flows from the Drake equation and flows from this habitable real estate And Fermi was very prescient because he framed his question in 1950, so 10 years before Drake from the Drake equation. And we hadn't found exoplanets. It would be decades before then. But he was just smart enough to realize the ingredients for life were in the universe. And he thought it would be unusual if we were the first or the only biological entities to get to our level of development. He thought it's unreasonable for us to be the first or the most advanced in a big universe full of the potential for biology. And so he sort of flipped the question from uh, where are they uh, to from are we alone rather to where are they? You know, he thought they should exist. They should be out there. So why don't we know about it? And and his question is very provocative and, and people still think about it because we don't know how to answer his question. And you, you talk also in the book about some of the things that we're looking for biosignatures. So I was wondering, what are some of the biosignatures that we're looking for? And, and what does that actually mean to say that that we found something that uh, that matches? Um, how, how does that work? Right. So this is the next exciting experiment. The reason why I and other astrobiology uh, people would would believe that we may detect life beyond Earth in the next five to 10 years. Um, So once you've found thousands and thousands of planets, finding the next hundred is not quite as exciting. The next stage of the game is is detecting life on any of them. And that's just a very hard experiment. So go back to the beginning of trying to measure something a billion times fainter than its star uh, and very close to the star in the sky. So the the experiment we're talking about, biomarkers or biosignatures, involves uh, using this point, large telescopes, these one meter telescopes won't do it for this experiment. Uh, you have to do beautiful optics to blot out the star by a factor of a billion. So you can see the feeble reflected light from the planet. You smear that into a spectrum and you look for signatures in the atmosphere of that Earth-like planet that indicate biology. And on the Earth, those signatures would be oxygen, ozone, water vapor, maybe methane, a few things like that. And, and oxygen is sort of the killer biosignature because the oxygen we breathe, one part in five of the air, was put there by microbes billions of years ago. And reversing the logic, if we see oxygen in the atmosphere of an exoplanet, it had to be put there by something because simple geology processes can generate a few percent oxygen, but they can't generate 18 percent. So in in the, uh, since this field has been developing and we're learning more and more about exoplanets, uh, is there anything that you think that we've learned about Earth uh, through learning about other planets? Um, 
or ways that that this sort of search for other exoplanets and study of what's out there can help us make better sense of how to take care, better care of the Earth? I, I think so. I mean, we've learned that planets evolve and have often violent histories. One of the conclusions from astrobiology in the last decade is that, you know, contrary to what Leibniz speculated in, in the in the book a hundred few hundred years ago, Earth may not be the best of all possible worlds. There are arguments that super Earths, of which there are many, it's the most common category of planet actually, uh, may be more habitable than the Earth is because they just have they can hold a thick atmosphere, they have geological activity, which we think was important in the formation of life. Um, and, and they can they can persist in their physical conditions for a very long time. The Earth, we now know, has had a violent history. Life almost disappeared from the Earth. It almost disappeared during the bombardment era in the first half billion years. It almost disappeared during during two episodes called Snowball Earth, where the atmos where the atmosphere got so out of balance uh, that the, the the planet froze, almost like a you know a billiard ball just covered in ice. Uh, and and life might not have recovered from that. It was a close thing. And so the Earth has had violent fluctuations that have threatened the persistence of life. And think we think we found exoplanets that are just nicer, gentler places for biology. The Earth is not the best of all possible worlds. So that's that's one perspective. And I suppose we also are learning that um, you know we can alter our planet too. And you know <laughs> nature will do it for us if we don't take care of altering our planet. Uh, you know, Venus is the object lesson in what happens if you let the greenhouse effect go out of control, for example. There are, there are plenty of billionaires and entrepreneurs and, and all sorts of people who are, you know, either actively flinging themselves uh, out of the atmosphere or are making plans to it, maybe even to go and, uh, and live on another planet, planet permanently. Um, you know, what do you think of this attempt, especially the idea of colonizing Mars? Is, uh, is this you know, something that you think is a is a real possibility in in you know this century, or is this more science fiction than anything? Well, it's clearly moving from the realm of science fiction to to future fact. Um, the timeline is not as optimistic as someone like Elon Musk may say. He he would he said he wanted to die on Mars. Well, he might get his wish, but and he's talking about a decade to have a Mars base. I don't think it's a decade. Um, it's several decades, but 30 to 50 years, I think it'll happen. I mean, these people, uh, Bezos and Musk, are sinking b several billion dollars of their own wealth into sustaining this entrepreneurial activity, and they're committed to it. And, and they've also changed the game. They've really changed the game. They've reduced the cost of putting a kilo or a pound into Earth orbit by a factor of 10 or 20 in a decade, which is incredible. And that's changing the game of space travel and leaving the Earth. So they've done an amazing thing, actually. Even though the rockets they're developing are still just cousins of the Saturn V, so rocket technology hasn't changed, you know, fundamentally for 70 years or 100 years. And so when we talk about leaving the solar system, that's a whole different matter. I mean, colonies on the moon and Mars, well, maybe in 30 or 50 years, but the distance to the nearest star, which might have an Earth-like planet, actually, Proxima Centauri has a couple of shots of that. Um, it's hundreds of thousands of times further than the distance to Mars. And so we don't have a technology that can do that at all. And the energy cost of sending big objects there, as opposed to little microprobes, which might happen, we might do that, um, is prohibitive. So I think you know the vision of exploring the galaxy, that's the true Star Trek vision, that's centuries away. Oh, I don't know how far away it is. Uh, well, on that note, you know, my, my last question, I've always, always find this curious. I, I'm a, a, a Star Trek over Star Wars person any day. Uh, do you have a preference for Star Trek or Star Wars? Yes, I do. I'm, I incline the same way. I mean, I've, I've watched all of them, of course, and I have my favorites among the franchises and so on. Um, you know, th there was always something about the the woo-woo aspect of Star Wars that kind of rubbed me the wrong way. Star, Star Trek was just seemed more grounded in science. And I also liked the fact that it laid out a cultural landscape of, of what we might encounter there and had a sort of moral centering on that. It had the concept that you shouldn't necessarily mess with alien life forms or mess with an alien world if you didn't have to. So there was some sort of conservation 
an ethical ethos that pervaded that franchise. So I think that's why I inclined to Star Trek. No, I think that's that's very well said. Uh, well, Chris, thank you so much for being a guest in the New Books Network. Uh, the book is Worlds Without End, Exoplanets, Habitability, and the Future of Humanity from MIT Press. Thanks so much. Yeah, it's great to talk to you, Caleb. Goodbye.